Cornell University and a senior research associate at the ILR School uh, at Cornell, um, as well as the executive director of ILL's, ILR's Labor Dynamics Institute and has been the American Economic Association data editor since 2018, um, as well as uh, lots of other qualifications that I won't list, but he's here to talk to you about data archiving and sharing for reproducibility, and I'm going to let you take it away. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kitty. Um, and uh, welcome back from all the breakout rooms, uh, everybody. So um, I'm the last uh, person to have a full hour. Um, and so um, yeah, that'll be a challenge, but I'll actually touch on a few things that I believe uh, you will have touched on over the course of the three previous days uh, as well. Um, so the hook here is data sharing and archiving, uh, where uh, you probably have figured out how to share data in a variety of ways. And I'm going to show you that many of those are actually wrong. Um, and I'm going to show you, though, that it's actually not that hard. Um, and that's where the archiving comes in. But the background to some of this is also that um, this is another one of those key features of reproducible science that has an ethical background. And I'll get to a particular point where I'll, I'll identify some of the balancing that needs to be done. It's not always a one-way thing that there's an obvious choice, but where some balancing needs to be done between openness and other ethical considerations, such as privacy of respondents, et cetera. I'm gonna argue that they're not contradictory in all circumstances, but you won't necessarily work the same way. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a very abbreviated version of the data life cycle. Um, I'm then going to actually use <clears throat> one part of that. Um, I've thrown in there that it might take as many as 20 minutes, but uh, in essence, this presentation is a reproducible dynamic document. And the survey that I sent out to you guys will We'll update that and we'll apply the data lifecycle uh, components that we have there. And I'll then spend some time and maybe some question time as well on what can you do about all these wonderful open science things when the data shouldn't be open, uh, i.e. when it is sensitive. And often what we encounter uh, in, in some of the articles that we review at, at the AEA is that the simple question about you have a confidential data set, and I understand you can share it, but are you actually keeping it in a particular archive? Finds, if I were sitting in front of people, blank stares, or at least non-conclusive information in emails. That is a hard problem, and that's an entire session on its own, but we'll touch on it a bit, um, including also about how to uh, think about licensing, which is um, something that, uh, most social scientists don't get taught about and don't do. Um, so we'll talk a bit about that. Um, all of this is very rough, um, and there's a bit of uh, flying by the seats of my pants at some point in time in there as well. So if you haven't already, and quite a few have not already, um, go to this form and just fill it out while you listen to the other stuff. Um, and we'll get back to the data generated through that form shortly. So no, don't take it too seriously. That's not the point. And I'm going, just going to leave this uh, tad up on, for those of you who want to fill it out on your, uh, on your uh, mobile phones or something like that, that QR code will lead you there as well. But it's also in Alex's email from this morning. Um, some background, and, uh, since you can um, share along with these slides, and let me actually give you the URL in the chat if you want to do that, because that's another way of doing that. Or maybe Alex has already done that. Where's my bar? I pasted the link to the form in the chat, but I don't think I have to link to your slides. And now you do. <clears throat> OK, excellent. Thank you. Um, OK. Back to uh, this. Uh, so two things I wanted to point to, uh, a uh, the, the bit of a longer talk about uh, all the reproducibility stuff that we have been doing amongst data editors, at least in economics. And I'm going to refer to the uh, FAIR principles uh, quite a bit. So I've put the link to those in there. It's, it's short and sweet, um, but it's, it's important. Okay. 
So um, the goals of what I'm going to try and achieve here is uh, a tell you that it's not that hard to curate data, and I'm going to tell you why it's not hard and what it means to curate, and when you should do so. And then finally, uh, thinking a bit about licensing at the very end. Okay. So um, in the well, I'm not going to call them good old days, but in the old days, um, for reproducibility packages, when sending stuff to a journal, you would send a zip file, zip up the stuff on your laptop, and then send it there. And it ends up kind of as a random file on a journal website. And then there's all these other problems. What if the data is not on your laptop? What if it doesn't fit on other people's data? What if the data is not yours to send? And I point out that nothing of what I'll tell you will prevent you from uh, archiving or sending or doing other things of data that you are not allowed to send. We regularly have to remove those from our application packages at the AEA. Read your data use agreement. Um, you might have clicked through it five years ago. It's still valid. Um, so all those things are, are problems there. Um, the first thing is that if you actually consider a package, you've just uh, put together that wonderful dynamic document that has both presentation and, and the paper driven from the same underlying data that's on your laptop. Um, how did the data get to your laptop? Um, how did the data get generated? Um, those are what we call provenance questions and they kind of get lost in the struggle often because you're focused on, yeah, I've collected all this data now I need to analyze and write a paper, uh, et cetera. Um, the second part that has been an issue is this random file on a journal website, or I could strike here actually journal website, random file on a website is often the idea that I've got it posted on my website. So what else do you want? I'm sharing it all. Um, and uh, all those things that you can then ask of that random file, hey, it's a zip file everything in the zip file? That's the kind of thing we test at the journals. Are they actually being curated or preserved? If it's on your website, the answer is typically not. Uh, can the data be reused? Is that same question again? Can the data be found independently of the article? And all of those types of questions are fair questions. So what is FAIR? Uh, just a quick reminder, it stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, goes back to um, Force 11 is called because they first met in 2011, but they came up with these FAIR principles and published them in 2016. You will encounter that uh, fairly broadly. I'm going to go over some of these issues as well. I'm going to do a bit of cherry picking because full FAIR compliance is a bit more of a challenge, but we can tick a lot of those boxes pretty easily at the end of this talk. Um, to get back to some of the ethical principles behind the FAIR is that making data stand on its own in a variety of ways, both human and machine readable, is the key element of reliable and transparent um, science. And so the subsequent reuse and knowledge gained from anything that you have posted out there is part of what the FAIR principles are meant to, to enable. Um, one of the things is that by doing it this way, uh, not only can this be done on an idiosyncratic way, such as I'm able to read that readme that you've put together that describes how you collect data, but true fair actually means it also needs to be machine readable so we can do things at scale, right? Um, it doesn't uh, it doesn't scale very easily if we have to parse lots of idiosyncratically written verbose descriptions. Um, as uh, we found at the AA, it also doesn't help if people describe how they actually ran the programs that way, but that's a different story, not for here. Um, but some of the robustness and the, the, the enforced transparency and the scalability that the FAIR principles uh, entail are important. We're going to touch on that. Uh, in this example of data curation, because we're going to do some of the tasks manually. Uh, I'll point out when they could actually even be done by scripts. Uh, definitely, I have done them, but probably not within 10 minutes that I've allocated to this. Um, but we are going to use the fact that a properly archived uh, data deposit under FAIR uh, can 
be used in a machine readable way, thus enhancing the transparency and the scalability of these kinds of things. Okay. So data lifecycle, you hear it often, it's really hard to find a definitive description or a definition. It's quite amorphous and it really depends on whom you ask and where you ask. Um, so uh, for instance, I've encountered data life cycles that explicitly end with the destruction of the data. And that is a data life cycle. It, is, it goes through this uh, part and it's meant for internal consumption within an industry or for a, 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 a biomedical instrument is where I got this particular set of descriptions from, right? And so the idea that somewhere along the line it needs to be destroyed is not wrong. It's not necessarily what we tend to think of in terms of reuse, but it is always present there. Um, one of the reasons and decision points here is when to destroy data or when to no longer actively preserve it uh, that involve decisions such as what is the value of the data and who decides on the value of that data. Now, most of what we hear in the open science literature is about let's make data more robust and I've, I've actively participating in making data more robust at, at the AEA by ensuring that it's more easily found that it is properly curated, et cetera. But the decision is there is simply, well, it should at least be present for longer than zero for some positive amount of time. But what is the ultimate utility of the data that we collect in this way remains an open question. Do we really need to retain all papers, replication packages for 10 years or for 20 years or for a hundred years or for a thousand? I don't know, nobody knows. And that's why that's actually a very hard decision. And I actually participated in a, uh, on an NIH panel um, on that particular topic. And we did not come up with a clear answer to that, but just some guidance on how people might evaluate within their disciplines, within their research group, et cetera, on what the value of the data is. Um, many in institutions make that decision on a regular basis. Government agencies have record schedules and they need to explicitly decide which types of data are destroyed immediately, which types of data are kept for three years, which types of data are kept for 10 years and which are kept forever in the national archives, right? Um, some other decisions say in the physical sciences, if you're looking at the CERN accelerator say, are embodied within the actual data collection process only a fraction of 1% is ever even kept beyond the instance that the data is generated. And that data itself has also a limited lifespan and gets distilled over time into ever more aggregated information. At some point in time, it is thrown away. Right? How long that is and how often that happens is not an easy decision. Okay. So um, data lifecycle might also include reuse. And so let's not destroy the data, let's, let's keep it after it's preserved um, and, and share and reuse. And that in essence means that while most of these graphs will have a closed loop, you're not necessarily the one reusing your data. Those are probably other people or other papers or other projects that are going to be reusing that. So that st starts that cycle anew, right? And we often see multiple papers going back to the original paper, grabbing the data from there and doing something with it because it is of particular utility, right? Exposed, it is pretty easy to identify very useful data sets. How do you identify them ex ante is the core of that discussion about the structure, okay? Um, now, when you think of this idea of plan, collect, process the data, analyze the data, then go out to preserve the data at which point you can share and somebody else can reuse it. Consider the following questions. You've seen over the course of the past uh, days of, of RT2, discussions about uh, analysis plans, pre-analysis plans of commitment to certain uh, analysis features. Um, we're gonna be talking about collecting data. So, once you have collected the data, the survey is closed, the period that you had that survey open is over, that particular collection is done. It will never ever be changed again. Do you really want to wait until the end of that entire processing stream to archive or preserve the data at that point, right? The data is not gonna change anymore. 
But your archiving decision, your preservation decision might be, if you're doing it at the end when the paper gets published in a journal, might still be four or five years away. There is going to be loss. There is risk of losing it, et cetera. And so it's a valid question to think, is that the right way to formulate the data lifecycle? Furthermore, once you have, for instance, an analysis plan, if you've registered that analysis plan, are you really going to change the process and analysis step, right? Are there things that you can already demonstrate that you committed to? You can record an analysis plan. You can also record an early version of the paper that uh, led to that analysis plan. And what are you going to use? Well, you're going to commit to using specific versions of the data set, and you're going to generate new versions of the data, right? So one way to modify this is to let's take that preservation step a step out of the cycle and let's think about how to incorporate it into a slightly different one. One way would be to preserve as you go. I've collected my data. I'm going to shove some stuff off into the archive, right? Maybe it's my backup going that I can go back and figure out the backup for the next 10 years. Right? Or maybe it's something that I'm going to do explicitly. I'm going to go on and process and analyze. And then what comes out of that is my analysis data and the paper, et cetera. And then I'm going to preserve that too, because the two are distinct. Right Now I have two points in time where I can do some of these things. And then I can start to share and reuse. But we can do, take that even one step further and even break the link between the collect and process. And one of the really good reasons to do that is because in the act of preserving, you might actually modify the data so that it is long-term pre preserved. And if others want to reuse that data, well, you are your first reuser. If you ever have contacted an author, hey, I'm interested in reproducing some of the things in your paper. Can you send me the data? Which is sort of the old style of asking for some of these things, right? And Fernando can go on for ages on how you can do that politely because we have templates for all of that in the Acre platform. But there is actually a risk to doing so that we've run into a few times because the version that the author will send you is whatever happens to have be on his laptop at the moment that you ask, which is not necessarily the version that's in the paper, which is not necessarily the version that he should have been using. And in some cases, it turns out it's not the version he actually used for the paper, but is the version that uh, is different from the version that got collected. So there are risks there of confusion between these kinds of things that relate back to improper, imperfect, uh, incomplete, or inexistent preservation of the analysis as, as it was there. One way to avoid that is the way that I'm going to demonstrate here is that you literally break that step into two pieces. You're going to collect say from a survey, you're going to preserve that raw data as it got there, which might involve that you're going to strip off IDs. And I'm going to point to the, say the JPAL or the World Bank handbooks on how to strip those things out. We're not going to talk about that here. And then you're going to use that preserved version, which maybe in the future, maybe immediately becomes available to everybody else in your own research. So you are your first reuser. And that ensures that your data is actually reusable as well as a nice side benefit. And then we can do whatever we want to do in terms of processing, analyzing, et cetera. And what comes out of that gets preserved as well. It opens up the possibility that we can also share this data. And I'll get to with whom um, much, more, much earlier in a very robust way. For instance, say you've collected a survey and you're going to use half of it for one paper and half of it for a different paper. Well, the raw survey data should be the same, and you can now share with the two different author teams in a very fundamentally uh, uh, right method. Okay, but you're going to come around and say, but I don't want to be scooped, right? If I'm going to put it out four years before I actually get to publish, somebody else might be really quick at it. I'm not going to do that. The key is that preservation is not equivalent to publication. The example I'm going to show you today will make it public, okay, but I'll speak to other methods of doing so at, at the tail end of this. Uh, in fact, preservation might not mean very accessible at all. In the NIH report that I mentioned uh, earlier, we actually talk about distinct states that something can be in, and the preservation state is typically one where the data is offline and really hard to access. It might be uh, encoded within uh, cold storage somewhere, used to be on tape somewhere in archive, and it takes effort to remove it from there and bring it back, right? All those books in the stacks that you have to um, 
request in your library, if you still request books in your library, they are being preserved and they are offline even from walking up to a shelf and grabbing them because that's the best way to preserve them. And then you need to rehydrate, recover, et cetera, extract them for preservation. So preservation itself does not imply publication. Publication itself does not imply data availability. Um, and as I'll tease about some of those fair characteristics, the key part about publication is that you publish the fact that the data can be made available, not that they necessarily are available at that point in time or in that particular format. So we, we have to think here of publication of metadata independent of the fact of data. But if you publish metadata, you also promise that the data described by the metadata is actually accessible. And that can only be reliably done if it has actually been preserved. So I'll, I'll get to some of these points when we go through the example. So coming back to the FAIR principles, here are some of the key features that uh, you, you are looking for for these kinds of things. So for one, to be findable, the F in FAIR, metadata have to be uh, assigned. They should be, or they are required to be, for, to be FAIR, globally unique and eternally persistent. Right? Eternally is a long time. That's hard. Um, data are described with as rich metadata as possible. We're going to skip over that today. Um, metadata, in order to be findable, have to somehow be found. So they need to be indexable or in the search index or something like that. They need to be in a catalog. Uh, if you know nothing about the data, then it can't be found. And that's one of the, the key issues. Okay. Accessibility means that you actually need to be able to read the metadata. And that means that both humans and machines should be able to do so. Um, and there's a requirement for metadata that even when the data are no longer available, remember that destruction phase, that the metadata still exists to demonstrate that the data have existed. And the metadata might be updated to reflect the fact and beyond today's date, they no longer exist, right? But the fact that they have at some point in time existed is important because you base your research on that. Right? To be interoperable means you need to somehow understand the data. A blob of bytes does not make a data set interoperable, right? Metadata is and are, are elements of the data set such as it's an XSLX file, which suggests that, but it doesn't confirm that, it's actually a readable Excel file in a modern version of Excel, right? Those are standards that the metadata needs to have, that the data needs to have that are described by the metadata in order for us to be able to read that. Ideally, they use vocabulary so that there's a controlled aspect, a common understanding of what they actually express. And to be reusable, well, they need to be legally reusable, not just physically reusable. And so there needs to be a clear and accessible data usage license, right? Um, as it turns out, many of the sites out there actually don't comply with that when they're on research-oriented sites because they're not licensed. They are copyrighted and principal copyright means you can read what's on the website and that's it, but you can't actually use it in your own research unless you have permission from the author. There's a whole discussion about fair use that we're not gonna get into, but that's what licenses are meant to address. So um, a few examples uh, from what, some, uh, some of the things that we have. So these are screenshots from a, uh, a deposit at the AA data and code repository. And one of the things that we ask authors to do on there is to add lots of metadata to the files that they deposit, right? And so in the screenshot here, there's information on there about the geographic coverage, about the time period, about the universe. Not all of those come from robust vocabularies, but it's one thing to uh, get data librarians to adhere to vocabularies, another one to get economists to adhere to vocabularies. Um, but at least some of the subject terms are, are enhanced to sort of come from that. And a JL classification is a standardized set of metadata in economics that allows us to classify this in, in a robust way. Some of this that gets embedded within the metadata repository, uh, in, uh, the repository's website, I'm sorry, into things that are probably here a bit too small to, to read, um, but they're embedded within the page. They're not the human readable part, they're the machine readable part that repeats in a structured way so many of these things. Those things are picked up by indexes such as the Google dataset search and other things. And so you can find this exact same deposit through 
that search engine or some of the other search engines as well with some of the rich metadata carried over, right? And reusable, well, embedded within that web page is also a license that is both machine readable and is displayed for users to find, right? Um, what is when data uh, are not shareable? Well, here's an example from uh, the, the German uh, labor market office. The establishment history panel is detailed firm level information. It has a web page. It has a DUI, which suggests that they're committed to maintaining it. Um, there is actually a statement somewhere on there for how long they promise to maintain it. And the access conditions are at least human readable, probably also machine parsable. But this is one step towards making it uh, much more fair in that sense. So the data, you can't download the data, but access is described. And that really is the only requirement of, of fair data is that you, there is some mechanism to describe what the access actually entails. Right? Access to this data is actually not trivial. It can take weeks and visits and, and other kinds of things, but it is definitely feasible to create fair metadata when the data are not shareable. Okay. What kind of access conditions are we going to be, we can think about in decreasing order of freely available, you can waive copyright, you can do anything with it, more academically sensitive, sensible means that you're going to have some sort of attribution required. Um, you might restrict it to university researchers, you might make it available after an embargo. You might have an application process that somebody needs to sign off on it might matter who that somebody is. Uh, you might check only for legal compliance or you need the PI to sign off. All of those are things that we've encountered and they're in decreasing order of desirability, et cetera, right? The most restrictive one might be one that you actually have to be called Lars or maybe even Lars Wilhuber in order to access the data. And I'll show you how to do that too, but that's not really the ideal. So you're gonna say, this is like way complicated, right? I'm not gonna encode my web page where I'm gonna post this kind of stuff. You mean I need to manage this application process for the next 30 years in order to comply with FAIR? And that DUI thing, how, how do I even get that? I can probably explain a lot of those things on how you would do that, but the whole point is that there are actually easy ways to do that. You, get, you ask the pros and the infrastructure that's out there to do that kind of thing for you. So let's jump in. We collected data, we have a survey, and so we're now going to go and archive it and use it in the way that I described it, right? So a survey has survey forms, um, has some metadata, uh, in this case has some sample data that describes kind of the schema that we're collecting and then has the actual data, right? So we're gonna preserve this in a place that is uh, customized for safeguarding scientific output, right? Um, one of the reasons journals have a role to play in this is that they actually take care of some of those things for you. So publishing in a journal is one way to ensure uh, safeguarding, but uh, reputable journals. I have seen journals that have gone under and have not ticked all these boxes and you literally cannot find any vestige of them because they were online only and did not have archival copies. Um, so there is, this is not always a panacea, right? And data should be stared in repositories. None of this is totally infallible or, or persistent. Who can commit to preserving it for the next thousand years? And Libraries have been ransacked and have been burned and I, uh, artifacts do get destroyed uh, on a regular basis. You can find stories about digital artifacts getting destroyed on a regular basis. But there are such things as trusted repositories. There are standards around that. There are, are, are common sense standards as well as an actual core trust seal that you can do. And they're tabulated by you for pros such as at Nature, at F1000 Research, at PLOS, at the AEA where we rely mostly on that. And there are common culprits out there that are there. And a lot of those common culprits are actually free. So what are not options for preservation? Don't even think about putting it out on GitHub and considering that as a deposit because it takes approximately 30 seconds uh, to delete a repository. I did that a couple of times actually last night in trying to set up this presentation. Um, Dropbox, when you stop paying, it'll be gone. Your personal website, nope, it's not the same because ultimately it can go away, you can reorganize it and that's an actual URL from, from some of these things. 
Uh, but even your university's departmental website is not robust as a way to do that because you're going to be hired by that fancy other university and your university is going to shut down your university website, at least a lot of universities do, and it's gone. Bye. Right? And if that was the way that you took this into account, you know, it's not particularly robust. So some of these options for self-serve preservation, um, I'm not actually going to demonstrate open ICPSR for you today. That's the one that we use at the AA, and it's certainly one of the options that are free for most personal use. I'm going to use Zenodo, <clears throat> the one that's actually designed to archive things uh, around that CERN accelerator. Um, we're going to use the sandbox. Um, they uh, warn you that you can anything can be deleted there at any point in time, but I've still found something from two years ago on there, so it doesn't happen too often, um, but it doesn't get into any indexes, et cetera. Okay, so um, we're going to use this sandbox. Uh, you should feel free to try out some of the things that are in here by creating your own account on Zenodo and doing that. Uh, there is an awesome tutorial at uh, the Harvard Center for Astrophysics, at least last time I checked. And here are the links to what for our particular case study, uh, our survey of browser tabs, we need it. There's a PDF of the survey instrument uh, because we can't archive the web form. There's some sample data, one record in there that demonstrates what this might look like. And if we want some of the other information, then the, here's a Google sheet with the updated data. And so by now, uh, quite a few of you have updated this. And we will encounter things such as uh, the fact that I did not impose any validation on how many browser tabs, so non-numeric values are encountered here. We'll see how robust my code is to that. I'm guessing it probably isn't, but we'll see. Um, so let's take this particular version. I'm going to download it for safekeeping. We're gonna use it shortly. And I'm going to go probably too fast for you guys, but since this is being recorded, you can follow along and try it out and all those kinds of nice little things. Okay. So um, I prepped some of this. So that's why I actually have a, um, uh, a repository already there. So I'm gonna show you what the initial deposit mechanism might look like. But in the context of planning and collecting data, I've already prepared um, all these things. And uh, that's actually, let me just go to the proper view. Okay. So you'll see that there's actually already two versions here that I've done, but the kind of view that you would see is this view where here's data. In some cases, it might be sample data. In some cases, it might be the actual data, and we'll be updating this. Here's the metadata, uh, the, the actual PDF of the survey, right? And then there's information on here about titles, my name, some machine readable idea about this, a description, and there would be other things further down here. For instance, uh, I have tagged this with the fact that it's actually associated with a particular conference, right? Um, and again, you can do this on many of these other repositories as well. What metadata is available? What kind of contributors or references or alternate identifiers you have there are, are, are key. Um, the, Zenodo is nice because these related identifiers are really quite rich, so you can link to quite a few things, papers that have used the, the particular deposit. Uh, you can link back to your GitHub, you can link to a conference website, all these kinds of things are feasible there. We're not going to go into uh, too much detail here. So I went ahead last night and uploaded some of these, and that's why there is a version one of this. This is the very first upload to this. Here's a browser survey, it's five kilobytes and the um, PDF here. But there also is a second version. And you can see that just based on the sum of the data, this is somewhat different. 
every time I update this, I get a new version, okay? And, um, and then one can publish, right? I can edit some of the metadata, I can create a new version here, and I can do all of those things, okay? So I have done so at the very earliest stage. I have recorded essentially what my survey instrument looks like. It's probably not complete because I might want to have the ability to export some of the survey information. If I'd used Qualtrics, for instance, I could have uploaded my QSR files and things like that. Um, because all of that is already fixed at the point in time that I launched my survey, or at least it should be. Um, uh, I could embargo it, and I'll get to that later on, because maybe there's information in the survey information that might bias the survey. Somebody found it, right? Um, probably now that I've revealed that the number of surveys is, um, is, not, uh, uh, is not required to be numeric, I'll find lots of nonsense, nonsensible stuff in there and anything after now. Um, but I could also publish it to demonstrate that I'm actually serious and make a point of this is actually a serious endeavor. Here's the DOI, et cetera. If you wanna look at why we do this and what the actual IRB approval is and all those kinds of things, then you might wanna do that, right? In the interest of time, and we're not gonna do that particular thing now, right? So I went through, I uploaded these things as a new upload and I published it and now they are preserved, okay? There's a few features here that we could use on top of that. Uh, we could tie in with uh, some GitHub stuff and uh, we can actually create intermediate versions both on GitHub and on this that for instance, are the ones that I'm gonna go and talk to my funder or if I'm a PhD student to my thesis advisor and I've locked in the version that I showed to him or her on September 3rd. And I can always go back and say, that's the version I showed you, right? So you can make that be um, as dynamic as possible. Okay. but. Uh, all of you can browse that original version. We're now gonna go forward with updating that version, right? So we have this part out there. Uh, we've uh, demonstrated how we can curate at an early stage. Now we want to do a couple more things. We have now collected data, and then ultimately we want to use the data, right? So updating the data. Let's go back to that. So. This is my view. You guys won't have the edit button there because you don't own this. And one of the things on Zenodo is only one person can own a repository. Other repositories um, may have other rules around that. For instance, OpenSPSR can have an entire team working on these kinds of things. Uh, so uh, that's, that's one of the things there. So I want to make a new version. Okay, I am going to delete the old browser, I'm gonna keep the name because I don't need to version the names, just the same that you learned that I'm in the Git tutorials that don't version with names, version with versions. And I'm going to upload something that I've called the same thing. My instructions to my team would probably be, if you want to update this from downloading it manually from Google uh, Sheets, you should name it browser-survey.xslx and then update it, et cetera. So those are the kinds of things that a complete, completely reproducible workflow would have here. Okay, I'm updating this. So this is now, Eagle Eye participants might notice that this is now six kilobytes, not 5.1. I can save this whole thing. And I understand that I will no longer be able to delete this, but of course this is the sandbox. So uh, everything is liable to be deleted. And now there's a version three, okay. So one thing to keep in mind is that, and this is a note of specific, every time I add a new version, there is a new DOI. If you were to do this on Dataverse, the DOI would stay the same, but they would highlight which, which version is there and it points to all the, uh, uh, all the previous versions, but it defaults to the latest ones. The DOI on the note always point to a specific one, right? So version two, and version one have different ones, but Zenodo has this idea of an omnibus DUI that will always work and will redirect you to the latest one. We're actually gonna use that um, in a moment, okay? So now there's the third version out there, but my first version is still around, so I can go back and demonstrate what that earlier version looked like, right? In fact, if you want to see what happens with the earlier version, we'll get to that 
in a moment. Okay, so uh, we've published this. Now we want to use it. Okay, so this is a uh, ARM Markdown presentation, an R presentation uh, that actually has no command line equivalent to my big frustration. Um, here's how we set this up. So I'm going to show it here on the slides, and then I'm going to go live to the to the to the R Studio instance to sort of update it. Right? We're going to use the machine readable component of an archive here. And this is, I'm using Zenodo because it is the most robust one, but others such as Mendeley uh, have some of these things as well. Dataverse has one that's still a bit rough around the edges, but is also doable there. ICPSR does not have one yet. Okay. So we're gonna need the particular deposit ID, right? And um, this one, we're going to use the one that is time invariant, but we could pin it to a particular one, okay? Because we're using the sandbox, we're going to construct that URL in a particular way, right? But if you were using the real Zenodo, then you would just strip out that sandbox thing there and you would have that part there, okay? So an API is essentially just a web service, right? And so we can go live there and I'll note one thing here, what is the DUI that this concept record ID redirects to is 136, the one right there. So where did we end up now? Here's the same concept DUI, but notice that by now, because when I ran this last night to construct these slides, I was still at my first version. Now it's pointing to the last version as the latest one, okay? If on the other hand, we would actually use that directly, right? We would actually have, we could ignore all the previous ones. Right? And so there are ways to get some of the previous ones because for instance, they're listed here. Um, so we could parse this out and do some other things with it. This is structured uh, JSON in this particular case, okay? You're not going to construct that by hand. That's what the service does for you, right? And we're not gonna, do anything here other than have embedded into our code the knowledge on how to read this. Right. So that's the information that we're going to get. It's useful to inspect because that allows us to sort of derive it because there is no package to do this. At least I think there isn't. I didn't look, but I wanted to do this by hand. And so we're going to parse this information into some of the key pieces because we're actually going to get that browser file that's up there that we just uploaded not from my laptop, because we're gonna get it straight from the repository, right? And that way I ensure that what I'm getting, if any of you are running the code, you're getting the same one. It's not reliant on the fact that it's on my laptop, right? And so the methods to doing that are, is that we're gonna download the actual metadata. We're gonna parse that metadata. One of the advantages of doing this is that I have a record in my repository of what version we actually used when compiling the latest slides. Right. And then we're going to do something which requires a bit of Googling and figuring out what the JSON looks like, etc. I'm going to figure out what the file are in a particular repository. Right. So this gets us within that JSON the complete list of files that are in that particular repository. Right. We're only interested in the Excel spreadsheet. And so I'm going to download it only if it's the Excel spreadsheet that embodies, of course, some knowledge that there is only one in there, or at least one of interest. Uh, so this is not the most robust code, but it works. And so I'm going to download that. And I'm skipping any other files because it'll list that that PDF is there as well. Right? So you can see that here, there's the PDF. Right? So I can choose to download any of the files I want. OK, then I can get it into R. And just because we'd like to know which version it actually is, here's the demonstration that when I compiled these slides, this was the actual DOI of the last version, which happens to correspond to version one, right? If we ran it again, it won't, and we will shortly. And so I can just generate, process and analyze this data set and generate my analysis. In this case, how many browser tabs do on average have Firefox users there? eagle-eyed viewers might identify that there's an error in my code that I fixed for the latest version, okay? 
So um, we have now preserved, we haven't preserved the final output of this. Um, actually, we have, I'll get to that in a moment. But we've curated the data necessary for reproducible analysis. I can pinpoint without reference to any of my own or my colleagues' archives or any ambiguity about which version we're running. Um, I've curated that. So let me um, quickly go over here. Is it still live? Yes, it's still live. So just to make things hard for myself, I'm running this in the cloud. So the cloud definitely does not have my local version. It has to come from the repository, okay? So uh, this is the RPress, R Markdown thingy there. Um, this is the one that's embedded within RStudio. Don't use it, use the one that Fernando showed. But what happens if I just run this whole thing again right now? Takes a bit of time. Okay. And this is what I meant about not validating, and now I have to adjust my cleaning, is that because there's some non-numeric text in there, my code didn't account for that, and now I'm getting that the mean is an A. That, of course, is just an R option. But we can also see that this has been updated. It is now literally using the last version of that, right? Updated as of, well, this is uh, Greenwich Mean Time, um, updated as of today. Okay, so we have used in the cloud the exact version that we just uploaded. Uh, and it doesn't actually reference those DOIs. That's because that's the sandbox. Sorry, that so that doesn't work in this particular demonstration case, uh, but that's the actual deposit that we had out there. Okay, just to go back to some of the other things here. All of our code and the slides are all updated to identify that. The screenshot is unchanged because that's a screenshot. And everything was driven by this. If I wanted to pin a particular version, such as the one from yesterday, I could just use the Zenodo ID here from yesterday's version. I could go back to that particular version. Okay. So let me go back to yesterday's presentation. So we, we have essentially done the archiving part here and the use of the archives as part of our code base to create uh, a fully reproducible um, workflow that can pick at robustly archived in theory, if we have, weren't using the sandbox uh, data, okay. Um, there are links in here on how to archive your research code. Uh, as it turns out, that's what I've done with this particular code too. But let me just do one last thing and then open the floor to some discussions, just very briefly talk about uh, licensing. So I already alluded to some of that, is that we have now a repository. We still have to essentially enable the share and reuse in a particular way, right? And we're gonna, in general, have to balance here at least two ethical priorities that we run into on a regular basis. One is maximizing openness, and the other one is preserving the privacy, maximizing the privacy of respondents, right? And those are gonna be uh, in tension when some of the data might be private, right? The example of the confidential Establishment history panel is one aspect of that, but it is feasible because they are curating this 
uh, to get back to older versions while in a secure environment, right? The access conditions here are contracts. So those are data use agreements they implicate in this particular case, not just the researcher, but also the university. And essentially the way that they handle it is that if you screw up your university is on the hook to pay them $50,000, uh, which they can be sued for for contract breach, which doesn't require any particular national laws or things like that. And that's what they're happy with. And that's how this works. Right? Others might be very different. So on Zenodo, and with some sides to some of the other things, what are your options to do so? Right. In this particular case, I took the default license. So it's an open access, and I chose a Creative Commons attribution license. Right. That means that anybody can do this as long as they attribute it, and by scientific standards, that means cite it. Right. But you could also embargo. Right. I could have chosen that this is an embargoed unit, and then um, the data would have been accessible to me, but to nobody else until that embargo date. I don't have to do anything. That embargo is, is, is a commitment uh, to do so. And um, that's one way to preserve and yet still um, be able to handle some of these issues. It, it generates complications because now that embargoed version can't simply be downloaded through the DUI as far as I can tell. Um, so you lose some of these features, but it is one way to consider balancing your own worries about some of these things down the road. It still means that it's under an open license. So it doesn't address some of those ethical issues. That would be if you do some restricted access um, on this data. That is a choice that Zenodo allows you to do. And it is very, very open in terms of what kinds of conditions you can specify in there. And I've seen them as write me an email and I'll consider it as one of the conditions not particularly robust. And that's why what actually is written in there, what is actually in the contracts is relevant, right? Hundreds of people can use the German data, but I have as data editors seen a paper that uh, we got permission to use because it's archived on Zenodo and we got permission the first time around, the second time around, the owner of the data simply ignored our emails. The readme now contains that your mileage might vary on that particular file, but it is preserved, right? ICPSR has a slightly different mechanism. It does not actually involve the researcher. That can be both a pro and a con because you, you kind of have to give up access or control over the data to do these kinds of things. Um, but it also addresses the question we had earlier about do I really need to approve requests for the next 30 years? Well, if ICPSR takes that role on, then you don't. The con is that you also lose control about who does it because you might not want it to be as stringent or maybe you want it more stringent than what ICPSR does. In their case, you have to uh, sign uh, agreements, involve the IRB, uh, do all sorts of things uh, which are legit. We have a few users on, at the A who do that kind of thing, right? And you choose that on ICPSR by choosing restricted access when the question pops up up there. And finally, closed access, which I don't suggest for doing um, effectively only makes it accessible to you uh, on Zenodo. Um, closed access is not an option on places like ICPSR, um, but there, uh, uh, those are uh, how these things are, are, are done there. I will note that these access rights can be revised because they're part of the metadata, not of the data itself. So you could, in principle, lock down access while you continue doing your analysis and then go in and hit that edit button, which allows you to edit the license as well, and then to do that. This is one of the reasons why at the AA, we actually have a contract with the author that they will maintain the open access because if a deposit is under their control, they can also change the access down the road. It's still preserved, but it's not accessible. Right? Um, so what are licenses in contrast to these access mechanisms? Licenses are the automatic or negotiated permissions to users of the data. So you will typically encounter them such as a Creative Commons license as something that's posted on the website. If you post it on the website, that license gives everybody who can see that license some rights to do things with it because in the absence of thereof, it's still plain old copyright, right? Um, but not every license is appropriate, right? And, and so many repositories are still in a data centric world uh, Creative Commons actually says, don't use this for software and code. And so we actually suggest a hybrid license. If you go to something like CodeOcean, then they have a hybrid license uh, enforced upon the system. 
Um, but most authors simply go to, with a default license, which in my personal opinion is not always the most appropriate. It has almost never been an issue. So this is probably uh, some, some uh, being very, uh, uh, very adamant about a point that probably isn't that important, but uh, we'll see. Um, so we suggest a dual license setup. Uh, if you care about this, uh, our template is there. You drop it in and you choose on ICPSR or other. Um, and I'm not exactly certain again what you need to choose on, on, uh, uh, on Zenodo, but there are ways to do this kind of thing. Okay. Um, and always keep an eye out for these uh, symbols as they're displayed because they're actually what typically applies to this. Restricted licenses or data use agreements when you are the user of data, keep aware of that. This little red thingy here says, if we can read it, the data themselves are not to be redistributed. And I can't tell you how many times we've asked people to remove the world values or the PSID or some other data that they're not allowed to redistribute, which is clearly written when they click through this, but is ignored. So I'll stop there. Um, I, what I've tried to go through is um, all the aspects about how to do this, making data as accessible as possible, as early as possible in the most robust possible way. Um, I think uh, with a bit of learning, this can be done. Uh, again, to demonstrate that repository didn't exist last night at 9 p.m. Um, I, I didn't expect to do it at 9 p.m., but that, that's the facts of life. Um, and. Uh, it now exists until they decide to wipe the sandbox. <laughs>